Okay, so here's the agenda. Um, I guess we'll start with uh, the informal hub team. Um, and I guess I'll let uh, Marius do that. Thanks, Jehan. Um, so yeah, what uh, we were doing in the last weeks. Uh, before that, again, the reminder, if you have uh, any topics that you would like to discuss, please add them to the agenda. Um, so yeah, um, next week, it's next week, right? Losing track of time. Uh, next week, uh, the hub will upgrade again to Gaia V12. Uh, I think the proposal will pass. Um, there is a forum discussion uh, regarding one of the parameters, especially the because uh, Gaia V12 is with LSM, right? And in LSM, there is one of the parameters that was not part of the signaling proposal. Uh, so it was added afterwards. The parameter can be disabled, but it needs, of course, a proposal afterwards. So it's up to the community, to somebody in the community to put up that proposal. Uh, I don't think we are going to do it. So at, at least I don't, unless somebody is asking us to do that. So again, it's a decentralized chain. Everybody can do it. It's a permission, uh, permissionless thing. So uh, yeah, I don't think there yeah. is any... Yeah, do you want to add something, Jahan, here? This this parameter, uh, it, it limits the amount that a given validator can have uh, liquid staked or delegations from liquid stake. Um, and, um, you know, so it's it's kind of like people were worried that it was going to make it so, I think, hurt small validators more or something. Um, exactly. And so, yeah, it can be, it can be, it can be raised with a, with a um, the governance proposal and it's also not really terrible to have it be somewhat limited at first um i mean i don't know what yeah so so i think if, even if it's even if it goes a couple of weeks before being raised not a big deal in my opinion but whenever somebody wants to make a proposal to raise it then i suppose it can be done um it's currently set but currently set very low no it's 50 percent. so basically a validator cannot have more than 50 percent of its stake to come from a liquid staking provider I think that's actually fine. Like, um... that's the reason we don't want to put a proposal ourselves because it's a, it's a debate, right? However, you do it, there will be a discussion, and we encourage that discussion, right? And exactly on the on the forum proposal, there, uh, this discussion happened, and uh, there are arguments on both sides. I don't think it has a huge impact since the safety mechanisms are in place through the other two caps. So it should be fine. Oh, actually, wait, you know what? I hear this criticism. Let me let me repeat back what I think I'm hearing. You just let me know, okay? So at start, um, like basically, suppose that you have a validator with 100,000 non-liquid stake tokens uh, delegated to it. This means it could only have another 100,000 liquid stake tokens delegated to it. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Brian okay. is on the call, so you can confirm that. Yeah, that's right. Okay. It could be set, it could be set at uh, much less conservative values and still be effective. I, I think we should. I, I like so like I'll plan on making the prop like when it goes up or when when the upgrade occurs. Uh and I mean I guess we could do it beforehand, but I think that we voted on this state of affairs. But I think it's a kind of legit concern because we look at this in terms of capacity, right? the lowest validators will have the least capacity to absorb liquid stake tokens. Um, and really, you know, especially given how skewed the hub is, um, we would almost want that to be opposite. Yeah, realistically, it's not gonna make a difference for at least a few weeks because the LSM will only allow delegators to convert stake that's already bonded to a validator into liquid stake, it will not increase the rate at which validators uh, assume new delegations from liquid staking providers. Uh, but in the future, we might get to that point. Okay, cool. 
And so the difference between this and the, and the just to cover that, because I know that was a question too, the difference between this and the validator self bond, um, which is currently set or not self bond, it's like these exempt, there's basically a thing where, where it has to be that validator has to basically bond stuff themselves. Um, and that's, um, it's called the exempt bond, I think, right? Is, is no, the, the difference is that it's not the self bond exactly, it's kind of complicated, but it's like, yeah, but it's, it's called the self bond. can't be unlocked. Oh, it is called a self bond. Got it. Okay. Well, the Tokens can't really be unlocked until uh, the validator ends or something. If there's so that the difference here though is that it's that setting is specifically about the validator. It's tokens that probably the validator would only have bond themselves, versus um, this uh, this other one is is taking all power into account. Right. Yep. That's kind of the, the difference between them. Yep. One oh. other small thing on this upgrade. I just put a document in the chat. We've been sharing this with the validators. It's a call to action for them to validate or bond. If they don't validate or bond, users won't be able to liquid stake to them in the beginning. And um, they might instead redelegate away from your validator. So it's pretty important that validators do this right after the upgrade. So if you, if you want to help socialize this, it'd be much appreciated. It will be interesting seeing all this unfold. Um, yeah. Because if um, somebody, I mean, if, if, if the delegator is delegated and, and the validator has enough capacity here that, that if the delegator turns that liquid and, and turns into a liquid staking token, that kind of is like them, you know, redelegating away from the validator anyway, isn't it, in some ways? In some ways, the validator keeps the delegation. The you guys on mm -hmm. on on stride, you keep the power that comes in. You you yeah. keep it proportional. Yeah. Well, it's yeah, up well, to that the would make a difference then. It's up to the liquid staking provider's policy, but on stride it yeah. stays. Yeah, cool. At least to oh. begin. Yeah. Well, Riley, regarding this document, did you share it on um, on Discord? I did because I okay, so great. So the validators are aware of. Yeah, sure. we hope yeah. so. They have a lot of questions. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Hey, Riley. Um, yeah. for like you asked if like for us to like socialize this, are you planning on like posting this as like not a Google Doc somewhere so that we can maybe like share it on Twitter or like a, a link to something that's not a Google Doc? We could. I wasn't planning to, but I would be happy to if it helps to have a link that's not a Google Doc. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And then we can, you know, share it out with on Twitter and, you know, maybe uh, talk to like the ICF about like where we can put this in terms of like getting more eyeballs on it. Cool. Do you think the forum is the right place? Um, I'm not sure. That's not super my area of expertise, but Jacob just gave a thumbs up. So I think that could be good. It can be forum. It yeah, can probably, even be, probably good. we can even put it on Gaia on the repo. Uh, Oh, yeah. Something that is needed, so that that shouldn't be a problem with either. Cool. I'll open a PR to Gaia as a readme. Cool. Great. Um. Okay. So that's uh, Gaia V12. Uh, hopefully everything will go fine next week. Then uh, the next one will be V13. So we follow the the monthly release cycle at least we are trying so what we want to add in that is cryptographic equivocation uh the code is done uh okay uh there is a discussion though on slashing uh this uh discussion is on the forum so uh, you see the link there it's pretty much you have an idea of how to do slashing in a very straightforward way basically once you receive evidence from a consumer chain, you just slash everybody. That is, of course, associated with that validator that uh, that uh, double sign, right? So this, like this, you may end up slashing a bit more. For example, you slash if somebody undelegated uh, before the validator misbehaved, right? So somebody undelegates, the bar validator then misbehaves that undelegator most likely will get slashed unless it's the unbonding period is done. So um, 
but again this will i don't think it really matters right it's so we can so that's that's the straightforward way to do it um so the plan i think at the moment is to add this and uh, in the meantime if we get negative uh, feedback from the community we just remove it the the code to add this is basically a few lines of so it's really small the changes are really insignificant so uh yeah so the the story on this i think is is that it's very hard to trust the time that comes from consumer chain or it's very hard to get the time of the infraction without trusting consumer chain and that's been the big um that's that's been that's been one of the really difficult things about slashing that we've been trying to figure out and so we started looking at what if we just don't have the infraction time? what happens then um and so the infraction time is used is what the infraction time is used for primarily um the most important role that it has in slashing is to make it so that if you un so like say if you undelegate from um informal staking and then the next block in formal staking double signs you won't be slashed for that double sign because we have the infraction time so or the infraction height right it's that same thing really and so basically because of the fact that your power didn't contribute to the double signing because you were already undelegated you don't get slashed um and so that is i mean that's a good property there's nothing wrong with that it seems probably is preferable really that it be done that way um but the the other thing is though also it's not complete it's not universal because if you delegate to if if you let me get this if i'm getting this straight marius if, if you delegate to um a validator um after they double sign but before they get slashed so let's say it takes two days for the evidence coming for some reason and so you you uh you were not delegated the validator then double signs, you then delegate to the validator, and then the evidence comes in, you're going to be slashed, even though your power didn't contribute. So it's kind of one side of the way it works. And it seems kind of, it's a little bit arbitrary. Um, and so but that's the way things are right now. And so what we're proposing, if we can't figure out what if we can't like, have a really, you know, um, objective and, and trustworthy uh, infraction time, then what we're going to have to do is um, is is not consider the infraction time. And so that means that if you are delegated to a validator, you then undelegate, and then within three weeks, within the unbonding period, the validator double signs, you will still be slashed. So that's the difference. And that means that, like, I mean, that's, I mean, that's pretty simple. I guess it's 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 that's it's, it's pretty pretty clear where I stated. And so um, it's making it a little bit stricter. Um, but it's also like, if you think about like, what is the scenario in which somebody knows that a validator is like about to double sign and they decide to undelegate? It's like kind of not really, it doesn't seem like a realistic scenario necess necessarily. Um, so that's that's the thing. And if we, if we try to get into trying to figure out how to get the infraction time from a consumer, um, that's that's a that's a rabbit hole that's very very difficult and so um like you can get it you can just trust them on it but how do you know you can trust that so it's it's a lot simpler just to say look we don't know what the infraction time is but if you delegate to a validator and then they slash within three weeks of you undelegating you're still going to slash so it's like kind of you know yeah but uh, the basically we're gonna put yeah go ahead the interesting thing here is that if we want to use smash which we want right so for Mesh, the trust assumption when it comes to consumers are even lower. Because here for replicated security, at least you have the same validator set, right? It's replicated. So you trust that validator set on the consumer. Uh, you trust the comment, right, on the consumer. Uh, let's say that for a mass secure chain, right? So with mass security, you look at a consumer chain. Why would you trust the validator set there? It's just another validator set. You don't have any control of it. You don't have any. It's nothing to trust it. And then the question is, do you actually trust something from that from that validator set, such as, uh, I don't know, some mapping from that infraction height to a provider. So all of this stuff. So this, uh, by changing it, like it is in the discussion on the forum, right? So if we change it with this proposal, according to this proposal, it will simplify a lot of things, right? And it will enable mesh. And I think, 
they will go with something similar for my security. Yeah. I don't think they we, have an we, alternative. Yeah, we worked on it, worked on it together with them. Um, we're actually, you know, providing them some guidance, honestly, on it. And um, they will be doing this as well. So uh, they're not going to consider um, infraction time. Um, and and well, also, I will also say that for Eigenlayer, obviously, I don't know uh, Eigenlayer on Ethereum restaking. Uh, you have a custom contract. So you can kind of customize it. Um, but but there there are people working, I believe there are, there's some people at least looking into doing mesh security with Eigenlayer. And so uh, that is likely going to take the lead of mesh security, which is also doing this type of, you know, doing this type of slashing. And so um, this is the kind of slashing I think that will be common throughout restaking. Um, and uh, also Babylon Bitcoin staking. I'm actually not sure. That's a very different thing. You've got to be bonded for like six months. I think you can be slashed anytime within the six months. So it's like, um, but it's similarly strict. Uh, in, in that, like, if you bond to a validator, like, there's no way to, like, unbond at the last minute, like, right before they double sign somehow, um, and which just seems, doesn't seem like a realistic scenario anyway. So we're pretty comfortable with it. Um, we were just talking this morning about whether we should do a signaling proposal on this specific, like, little point of detail, but, like, I kind of feel like we'll spell it out really, I, I, I don't know, it feels like that'd be a, uh extra effort and, and for the validators for voting and everything to, to, to do the signaling proposal things. We may just really spell it out really clearly in the V13 release proposal, because this is going to, I think this is going to kind of be the only thing um, in V13, although actually maybe I'm wrong in the number here, but uh, yeah, no. so, you know, I think it's only the only thing in V13. I just saw the Haifa testing has started, so it's kind of interesting. But anyway, the point is, I think, we're still deciding whether we want a separate signaling proposal for the slashing thing or whether we just want to roll it into the release. Um, but I feel pretty good about it. There's one other detail, which is that right now, old evidence is discarded. Uh, so you don't get slashed from old evidence on the hub. Um, but people don't realize this, but it's actually evidence that is over 70 days old is what gets discarded. So it's kind of like, not I think probably not working the way that most people think. Um, there's some weird stuff in the code. I'm not sure why it was like that, but um, it's it's 70 days. It's a million blocks. And so this also, given we don't know the infraction time anymore, hypothetically, if a validator double signed 100 years ago and they never got slashed back then, um, and then they're still using the same key and someone submits the, the, someone submits the evidence, uh, their delegators could be still be slashed from that, even though maybe those delegators weren't delegated 100 years ago. And so... That's like, obviously, I mean, that's maybe a little ridiculous to say it's three years to not be ridiculous about it. But basically, um, that's another factor. Um, but there are, I'm also okay with that, though, because, um, so first of all, the uh, it's unlikely that you would double sign and not get slashed because the evidence gets submitted automatically. It's it, the scenarios in which, I mean, I suppose, like, yeah, you could, I don't know how that would even happen, but maybe they, they double sign on their machine and then like the evidence they caught it before it got gossiped or something like that, or who knows, like, but it, it doesn't seem very likely. Um, and the other thing is though, if that even does happen, so if a validator does realize they double signed and somehow they kept the evidence from getting out, then um, what it will, what it will do is, is uh, if, if they, if they um, reassign their, um, if they, if they reassign their, their key, they reassign their consumer key, then um, after three weeks, they won't be slashed anymore. That'll make the evidence expire. So um, it's very important that validators redo a key consumer key assignment if they have double signed in the past and weren't slashed for it. And I can think of two validators for which that's true. So make sure <laughs> make sure to send them the ADR uh, and I'll, let them I'll know they might want to reassign I'll their keys. That. Yeah, if... Uh... So once uh, this uh, proposal goes out uh, and the cut the release and put it on forum and put it on the hub, we clearly have to document properly what's uh, and to update yeah. our documentation actually how is this changing because it's an important change. Um, okay, but Marius, hold on. There's actually some other. I said I don't want to use it the whole time here, but there's some other stuff too. There's some sanity checks about the validator power, which we are also not really able to access, and for sure the validator power. Um, it's, it's like they, there's a thing where it checks the power of the entire validator set against like what it comment had in the records for that block. And that's kind of a sanity check. I was wondering, do you think that that would be, uh, Marius, if you like, that maybe could make it more likely that somebody is double signing on a test net that has the same chain ID. Um, 
would that be is that a concern at all do you think like if someone if, double signed on some kind of yeah go ahead if you have a test net with the chain id what will differentiate the actual signature from on that test net from a proper chain so let's say that i'm creating a test net with uh, the chain id cosmos hub dash four or whatever it's yeah it's cosmos hub dash four what and some and the validator signs on that i can use that signature to show that the double sign right so i think validators and they have node operators should be aware of this i don't know exactly so it's a question to ask uh a validator team, so one of the validator operators. But in my understanding is that you shouldn't sign on things that have the same name as a mainnet. Well, you should not with your key, with your mainnet key. You should not be signing. You should not be signing. Well, I mean, I guess that's pretty much, <laughs> yeah. you, you shouldn't be using your mainnet key on test nets. I mean, that's that's probably something that's pretty clear, but, but especially now it's especially important, not just for OPSEC, but do not use your mainnet key on test nets. So maybe that's something we should communicate about a little bit uh, as well. Okay, so to move on, um, we also start working on uh, interchain security to upgrade it to SDK 50. The, uh, the main reason for this is, no, the main reason, it's clearly we maintain interchain security we will continuously upgrade it to different versions of SDK. This particular version of SDK, it happens to have a fix for the Neutron problem, right? So that's the reason we want Neutron as soon as possible to come back to be able to use uh, mainline SDK as soon as possible. I don't know if they move to a fork yet or they plan to, uh, but uh, and any other chain, right? That uh, will launch as a consumer chain will have the same problem. I'll, till they have 0 0.50. The other thing is also 0 0.50 comes uh, with IBC8 that will have a bunch of uh, new things, including channel upgradability, I think, if I'm not mistaken. That's also something to enable consumer chains to upgrade to that if they need it. Um, so what we, we, our plan is to, I don't think it's a difficult upgrade. Uh, so we will plan to do it in September this month. So, and to align it with the SDK and IBC releases. So uh, nothing uh, that much to say there. Uh, yeah. And so SDK and IBC releases also, they plan to release together at the end of the month, I think. I, I guess, so. I'm not sure, but I think this is their plan. Uh, I think SDK already has at least candidate. IBC, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Uh, Gaia with Aya. So the other thing is Gaia with SDK 47. So uh, we are working on this for a while. Uh, the, we started an audit. It started last week, a six week audit. We discussed about it before. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, thank, first of all, the binary team uh, for the support with this. They helped us scope the audit, it's amazing. Um, an important thing here, the prerequisite, the prerequisite to upgrade Gaia to SDK 047, we need LSM to work with 047. Uh, so this is something that uh, the Stride team and the Inclusion team uh, said that they will collaborate together. So this is, I would like to ask what's the, if there is, what's the status there? Is there a timeline or? Yeah, I think Zaki and Inclusion said they would be mostly responsible for it and we'd be happy to help out, uh, but I think it's mostly in their camp. Uh, we can dedicate some dev hours to it. Um, I'm mostly waiting for Zaki to chime in in the chat. Okay, so we'll uh, try to get in touch with Zaki and uh, follow up on this. Um, yeah. The the goal here is to upgrade. Okay, thanks, Jacob. That's uh, good to know. Uh, the the goal here is to upgrade the. Basically, because again, it will be Gaia v14. That's the next slot. And since v13 will be ending up on the hub somewhere in October, is that correct? Yeah. Then v14 will end up on the hub uh, somewhere in uh, November. And this is also good because you can cut a release candidate after the audit is over. So they kind of fit in place. Uh, any other? Ah, yeah. Uh, the, regarding the LSM with uh, 047, Jacob, you are saying that there is a problem on, uh, I've seen it in the 
on persistence. Do you can you elaborate on oh, that? Oh, uh, not not a problem. Um, actually, I think that things are very good. Um, like I believe they have a running mainnet uh, with LSM forty seven, and uh, I, it, it's possible we may be able to just use their code, and that's actually why I was saying we might want to talk with them um, because I think that. I don't know what it is yet. I haven't actually reviewed it. I wasn't anticipating they were going to put LSM on their chain, but I saw that Yoren uh, made a tweet about it today, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. Okay, that's weird. Why do they have LSM on a liquid staking provider chain? Anyway, um, yeah, let's uh, let's move on. But this is really interesting. If uh, it's already ported, that would be great. Of course, we need to see if it's the same version of LSM. Good. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention is that um, we have the, I, I mentioned before that we had the consumer side of throttling, the version two of throttling is uh, it's already done. And uh, now we have been reviewed the provider side. So once we upgrade both the provider and the consumer, then they will work nicely together. So, and uh, the cool thing is, and thanks for Sean, uh, to Sean for this. The cool thing is that we do not need the coordinated upgrade across all interchain security chains, which that's the main thing that we try to avoid because that will be quite difficult to do. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I'll just add the throttling is for, um, it will now really only be for, for, for jailing uh, packets for downtime jails. Um, because obviously the cryptification is being taken care of uh, cryptographically. Um, and so what it does is, is the new code will actually bounce packets if it's received. Um, a few jailing packets from a consumer chain already will bounce future ones, uh, and they'll have to retry later. Um, and that's to prevent a situation where a consumer chain sends a crap ton of jailing packets at once. Um, and uh, the root reason for this is there's no cryptographic way to verify downtime, unfortunately. Um, so yeah. So let's move on to uh, Hypo's uh, test and stuff, I guess. Yeah, cool. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, I can give an update. So Dante has started uh, upgrading our, our uh, testing framework to work with Gaia v13. I believe, uh, Marius, we should be expecting our first release candidate from you next week. Is that still on schedule? Uh, yeah, end of next week, worst case scenario, the Monday afterwards, but I would prefer to be end of next week and most likely okay. to be. It is, I think one thing that uh, we need to start understanding is how exactly we should be testing this in the public test net. Um, so my understanding is that this is both the provider side change and a consumer side change as well. Is that correct? Maybe we need to run a consumer side, like a new consumer chain to test the- uh, No, it's the not. It's just a provider. It will not affect oh, the consumer. Because even if the consumer still sends those slash packets, I don't think we even disable that. Maybe we should, now that I think about it. Uh, Anyway, this changes at the moment we are focusing on Gaia, on uh, SDK 047, uh, 45, because we focus on Gaia. Um, so that's an optimization. So let's ignore that uh, for now. Uh, so the consumer can still send slash packets for uh, cryptographic stuff, and they will be logged. And we just have to disable the, uh, the equivocation proposal, because yeah, we clearly don't want proposals with proposals on the hub. Uh, besides that, I don't uh, I don't see anything that the consumer needs to be changed. But once we okay. bring this to forty seven, since I I think neutron is still on forty five, but not for long. So I don't think it's really worth putting effort into do do some doing something on the consumer side. Uh, so it's just the provider that needs to be tested. And of course, so, you need to, to have a double sign on the consumer and you need to use, and this is what we can discuss afterwards, uh, to, to give you exactly the link, you will need to use a specific version of Hermes. 
So for this, Hermes will release uh, will have a new release. In the meantime, they have a special branch that we are using for our test nets. Uh, that they are sending these messages. Okay, so we, we need to communicate to relay operators to to upgrade to this version of Hermes once this is on mainnet. Um, cool. Uh, the next. Uh, well, the next... just just to be clear on the relay stuff. Only one person really has to run the special relay, right? Because that's just the one that submits the evidence. Yeah, only one person. But I mean, need to do I that. guess it's good if they all run it though. So. Yeah. I, yeah, like I would say, anybody who's actively relaying is probably the one running that. Um, because then I think you just get better coverage. Or like, you know, it's a slash packet, you don't want it getting stuck as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I already discussed with the Hermes team and uh, once they release, they will uh, communicate to all relay operators to upgrade. So this should not, there shouldn't be a problem. Again, the release cycle for Gaia is like one month from the time we uh, cut the release candidate. For Hermes, they can release immediately, so it shouldn't be problematic. Yeah. Uh, other than that, there were no major testnet events in the last two weeks, um, so a lot of our work has just been focused on improving tooling, uh, preparing for uh, upcoming testnet events. Uh, one thing we did was unified our testnet faucet service, so all test nets that we run, uh, the, the Discord uh, bot that we run on, on the Cosmos Hub community Discord now uh, dispenses faucet tokens in from a single bot. Uh, we had an issue with the duality uh, testnet uh, chain uh, in the last week where it prematurely offboarded. Um, the reason for this was there was a VSC mature packet uh, that wasn't uh, relayed back uh, due to a relayer issue. Um, so one of the takeaways there was uh, just to increase monitoring around uh, if there are VSC mature packets that are close to triggering at the VSC timeout, uh, having alerts around that. Um, so we've been uh, looking into setting up that in our test nets. Uh, I believe there's also an issue in the Interchain Security repo uh, to be able to query ESC mature packets. Um, we've also added a uh, semi-automatic uh, re testing report cards just to increase uh, transparency around all our testing efforts. Um, you can see the V12 report card that we generated uh, uh, in this link here. We'll be creating these report cards for all future future upgrades as well. Um, we've been also helping the Noble team uh, plan for their testnet uh, switchover, which is a uh, Kind of been pushed back a little bit. It was supposed to be this week, but now it's going to be September twenty seventh. Um. Also, uh, I think we're going to be relaunching the Stride testnet, uh, in the coming weeks. It's not in the agenda, but uh, unfortunately, it was also uh, uh, removed a couple of weeks ago, and so we'll be relaunching it. Uh, that's it for me. Well, uh, let's move on. Um, a fee abstraction module. Uh, yeah, I added there that there. I just wanted to to get in touch with the notional team and ask what's the status there because at the moment it's in draft. It was at some point ready for review, and afterwards somebody moved it in draft. And I don't know is it in draft because uh, what's the reason it's in draft? Should we review it? I guess not. I, yeah, I think it's not. Um, there are some changes being made to the abstraction because of uh, changes made in osmosis. Uh, we use a contract that's on osmosis 
uh, to do this, and that contract was upgraded, so we changed the fee abstraction project. I think the contract is called XCM, but uh, I think I also could be getting that confused with a polka dot term. Um, so, do you happen to know offhand? Uh, me or with whom are you? Ah, you are talking to somebody else. Okay, sorry. So I guess the conclusion that it, it is in draft and uh, we'll just wait for uh, it to move back into uh, review. Okay, cool. But that's the yeah. important thing. If it's in draft at the moment, uh, then the next slot for it to get into Gaia and to get on the hub will be V14, right? Because I it's unlikely that now it's on draft and by the end of next week, it will be ready to put in V13. Right, so in V14, we plan to have with SDK 047. Unless, I don't know, there are, there are delays with the LSM or delays with the audit or they find something in the audit that we, we don't touch SDK 47 until they fix it, whatever. So there are some reasons to delay, but if not, we'll need the, the fee abstraction on 47, which I guess is not a problem since it's running on osmosis. Or it's not running on Osmos. It's just something that Osmos, I, I don't know exactly what's the context of the fee abstraction. It means the price fee, right? The price feed, right? Yeah. Okay, so there are versions for different, uh, that's great. Uh, so that shouldn't be a problem. Cool. Yeah, one other thing I wanted to bring about the fee abstraction, I always felt that it would be better to use a consumer chain um, for this. However, obviously, Osmosis is the only chain that supports it right now. But uh, we may want to talk to the uh, Noble or, uh, sorry, no, uh, Neutron or um, or Astroport teams about about offering uh, support for the API that it uses, um, because it would be it'd be best to give uh, to give that business to to a consumer chain probably. But but I guess we'll uh, uh, maybe ping them separately or something. Um. So yeah, I guess we can move on. Uh, Atomic IBC, um, we've released. Um, so Atomic IBC is a thing that we've been working on for a while. We've had it in sort of, um, we've had some Twitter spaces about it. Um, we had some early drafts uh, that we've been working on of um, kind of the um, of of the of the paper, and it's it's a major feature that we want to build. Um, we want to get started building, um, and uh, so. The, uh, the the blog post is out. This is a little bit more of a light paper. It kind of describes the rationale and some more lighter technical details. Uh, we'll be releasing kind of more uh, complete um, technical specs uh, later. But um, Atomic IBC is basically um, it's a way for it's a way for consumer chains um, or consumer chains at least that opt into Atomic IBC to uh, be able to exchange IBC messages atomically. And atomically means it's basically instant. So it's like, it's kind of like a contract call between different contracts on Ethereum where that just happens instantly. Um, and, and during the time that the call is happening, it's, it's synchronous. So nothing else is happening during that time. And then also if, um, if you send from one chain using an atomic IBC and it gets sent to another chain, um, then, um, if it errors, if something, if you have this sequence of transactions you're trying to do, like trying to trade for something and then move to another chain to arbitrage, um, have some complicated series of transactions. If a transaction at the end fails, then it will roll back everything across all chains. Um, so that's the goal. Um, and it was kind of motivated by, um, you know, me thinking of, I mean, Atomic obviously has been something we've talked about for a long time wanting to do um, as a feature, but also I, I, I'm just thinking about the future of the hub and, um, and also where the shared security space is going. It was something that um, it seemed like the the, the, the best path uh, to take things. So basically um, the reason the reason for that is that, um, you know, shared security is is not, it used to just be something that we were building for the Cosmos Hub. And, you know, I guess there was you know, Polkadot and stuff too, other shared security stuff for sure. But um, now it's becoming much more widespread and we have projects of mesh security like Eigenlayer uh, that are basically using the same restaking technique uh, to provide shared security, even Bitcoin with Babylon, they're gonna have Bitcoin staking, um, and so that means that there's going to be a huge number of shared security providers, much larger than the hub. Um, and in general, 
uh, it's also just going to be a market where you can always go and turn away uh, from the shared security you're getting if you can get it somewhere else cheaper. Um, there's going to be kind of a probably a minimum quality standard. Like you're not going to want to get security from some chain that's completely unreliable because you're not going to trust they're actually going to slash when they need to. But beyond that, I mean, it's going to be a sort of fungible. So if you can go and if you're getting security from the hub and you can go to Ethereum and get the same security, you know, for cheaper, you might want to do that as a project. And so, um, the uh, the idea with Atomic IBC is to really lean into the atom economic zone concept, and that's this concept that um, this concept that you know you have these consumer chains that are all kind of working together, and you see that on these on these calls too. You know, with uh, we had the Stride folks, uh, Riley in here, um, and you know all these chains are kind of working together towards a common goal. And so at Atomic IBC is sort of a way to lean into that by making it so that not only are, are all the chains, the consumer chains, working together. But if they participate in Atomic IBC, um, they also have a much tighter technical integration that would be than, than would be possible otherwise. And I think that, and there's more in the paper on the theory behind this and stuff, but I think that in the future, that's really how people are going to decide or projects are going to decide where they want to deploy is basically what, you know, what they want to align with. And that's already really the case too. If you see like with the, the you know, the role of projects around Ethereum, a lot of it's just based on alignment with Ethereum. That's also the case with with uh, interchain security of the Cosmos Hub. And so we want to provide this this way for these separate chains to have a much tighter integration with other um, Atom Economic Zone chains than they could with external chains. And that will just build the network effects of the Atom Economic Zone and make it so that the more chains join, uh, the better it is to join, which is kind of what you, the network effect is what you want in, in kind of a, in, in, in a business. It's like to be able to have a kind of a snowballing of, of making it more valuable. So. Um, there's a lot more of the paper, um, and, um, we're going to, oh, one other benefit of it is, so the way it works, actually, it kind of just takes all the consumer chains that are participating with Atomic IBC. And since they already have the same validator set being replicated security consumer chains, it actually just puts them into one chain, um, except they can run their transactions in parallel. Um, so it's like sharding execution. So it's like one chain, but it's a much more scalable chain because it runs in parallel. But then when they want to exchange an atomic, when they want to do an atomic, somebody wants to do an atomic IBC bundle where they're doing a bunch of transactions that go between consumer chains in the seamless way, those then run sequentially. So it's like a hybrid sequential parallel um, model. And one benefit of that is that was just the simplest way to do it. But also another benefit of it is that it will reduce um, validator costs. Um, so basically every chain that uses atomic IBC um, will will basically um be they will be on the on the same um they, they'll effectively they'll be it'll be like one it'll be effectively the same cost as running one chain um for running potentially a bunch of different consumer chains all using atomic IBC. so um yeah i talk all about all that stuff in there and we're we're hoping to um get started on that probably and i mean we'll probably do a little bit of preliminary work this year um for sure but also mainly getting started on that and in 2024. And the first thing we're going to focus on is the part of it that provides those cost savings. Um, and then we'll layer on the actual atomic IBC later. Um, and then uh, I guess the next one is the um, oversight committee. Um, I guess is someone from is Lexa here or um, Udit or did somebody want to go on? I can also explain it too. But well, I guess first of all, are there yeah, any questions uh... about atomic IBC? Well, I hope that's sorry, I forgot that. No question. All right, let's move on to the um, oversight committee then. Okay. Yeah, this oversight committee uh, piece was uh, put on the forum by Lexa uh, from our team at, at Haifa uh, this week. But uh, actually, this is uh, came out of lots of discussions with a bunch of people, Abra, Jahan, uh, myself. Um, and essentially, it is a very minimal spec for uh, how to provide set up the right kind of oversight structure for a community spend proposal. Um, after a, a lot of this is actually inspired by by Notional's uh, um, uh, oversight structure right now, which takes this uh, this principle at its core that ultimately the oversight. Uh, is always in the hands of the community. The community can always uh, remove uh, remove funding. Um, 
And so the idea is, uh, well, if you want if you want to have an oversight committee that is impartial, uh, the oversight committee should be both selected by voted in by the proposers of the of the funding and the community. So a community spend proposal should actually be seen as two things. It should be seen as uh, uh, an approval of the funding request and also simultaneously a, an approval of the committee. So the proposers are putting forward a committee and the community is voting in the community at the same time. Um, in prop potentially an ideal world, the way you could have done this is that there would be a separate proposal for the committee separate from the community spend so that you could kind of break this up into, into two phases. Uh, but just for kind of like efficiency, you can see the community spend proposal is doing two things simultaneously. Um, and yeah. so the, oh, this, this, so, so this, the spec basically lays this out clearly and talks through the core principles and what the, the role of this oversight community really is. And this is also sort of the uh, Elijah had a post on the forum uh, about governance um, and in that it was very, I mean, his post was pretty high level uh, and, and, you know, not necessarily getting to a ton of specifics, but one of the things about his post was that um, it proposed sort of a, um, a global uh, sort of governance committee, right. And, and, um, or oversight committee. And I, you know, we, we sort of think that, you know, we've seen this and it's, it's like, I, I don't know if that, that may, maybe if that committee is really good, it could be a good system, but I think there's also been in the past, there's been a ton of resistance around people trying to bring that kind of thing in for obvious reasons. Um, I think there was like in Adam 2.0, that was a major point of contention about Adam 2.0 was the, the council or whatever. So it's this concept of having some kind of a group, a small group of people who are given like a ton of power to decide things for the cosmos hub is something that people haven't really hasn't not resonated with with atom holders in the past and so this work was kind of thinking about hey how do we have you know how do we have committees that provide oversight but they're like scoped um they're scoped to like specific projects and it's a little bit more about like giving the you know control to the community like for instance so for 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 this example here with this oversight committee it's like you know, uh, in that post, it outlines how it works. The oversight committee basically comes in at the same time the spend proposal comes in. The oversight committee provides the service of sort of condensing and distilling the work that the group has been, that the ex you know, the team, the execution team has been doing, um, sort of condensing those into, um, into like reports or meeting minutes or stuff for the community. Um, and then the community and the group also, the oversight committee also have the power to, to stop the funding. Um, and it would be like notional funding where it's, uh, where it's on a vesting account over the, you know, the time of the project. Um, and so the committee has the power to stop the funding, but also the community at any time has the power to stop the funding and dissolve the committee. So it's sort of, it de-emphasizes the role of the committee from being like, these guys are going to decide for you and they know best and they're going to do it right. So don't worry about it. It kind of changes it to like the committee is also performing for the community. And if they do their job well, then the community will know uh, what the team is working on, and they also will the team will be steered in the right direction um, if if the if the committee is doing its job well. Um, but if they're not doing their job well, then they can be removed um, just as easily as the as, as the team. So that's kind of the the thinking behind it is to remove is to change the role of the committee from being like this center of power to being more of um, a bridge more of a, a knowledge it's more of a knowledge role yeah it's like it's about distilling distilling things so the community can make decisions versus making decisions for the community so that's kind of the um the thinking behind it and you can read more in the in that forum post um so yeah yeah and and jacob to your point like i i think it's less of like the community um shouldn't be like reverting the decisions of the council or the committee it's more of like the committee is always held accountable to the to the community so like ideally they would never like the committee's not actually like making any decisions that the community is not already making there so if if the community wants to like claw back funds then that's it's not really a reversal of like what's happening it's just like a like you know Udit and Jahan have said we're seeing the committee as more of like a 
uh, an active arm of the community itself, um, just holding everyone um, on the performer side accountable. Yeah, and, and the other thing I'll say is that in this design, it has the committee coming in with the team and they're in one proposal. Um, and most likely they would probably, I mean, I assume they'd probably be nominated by the team. Um, and so there, there were some debates, I, you know, in, in Elijah's thread, I was, I was, I was bringing this up or an early version of this. And, and he was saying, well, you know, that's a big conflict of interest. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't think it is. I think it's like, basically, um, if you're not relying on the committee to be this perfectly impartial, um, impartial body, that's always going to do everything right. It's not as much of a conflict of interest. Again, if you go into it, like you go into it looking at like, you know, hey, the, 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 the committee and the team are both responsible and they will both be removed if they if they don't fulfill it. Then it kind of, it's a lot less of a conflict of interest than if you have some global committee, which is just, you know, given free reign. So um, yeah, I guess uh, any any questions um, about either of these things? Otherwise we can probably... Uh... Hey guys, uh, I, I have a question about the optimistic governance stuff. I'm actually driving right now, so I apologize if you hear some background noise. Um, so... Uh, myself, uh, I work at Blockworks Research. I'm also at Effort Capital on Twitter. Uh, first time joining the call, so thanks for having me. Um, I actually just got off a call with RMIT, who is doing some governance work related to the Atom Economic, uh, I'm sorry, the Atom Accelerator Grant. Um, and they're going to be posting something on the forum in the next probably four to five days. And it's around this exact idea around optimist governance. And one of the things that they're going to be proposing is potentially each consumer chain uh, hub relationship has its own like governance committee so like stride hub would have its own committee um especially if we or if we think like the future business model of the hub is not just shared security but additionally potentially protocol and liquidity um like maybe this governance body over each consumer chain hub relationship uh is kind of maybe like dually elected by the consumer chain and also by the hubs that there's like a neutral third there's a neutral party that's working on behalf of the hub there's a neutral, there's a person that's working on be, or a group of people working on behalf of, of the individual consumer chain. And then that committee is kind of overseeing like the protocol and liquidity, liquidity as a service uh, relationship between the, the hub and, and the, the given consumer chain. Um, obviously this wouldn't work for something like Notional who's doing like more service provider. Uh, so like maybe they would be able to vote their own oversight committee in on, on top of the spend proposal. But I think specifically for protocol and liquidity, liquidity as a service, it might make sense to do more like uh, like what I said before, like a consumer chain hub uh, oversight committee that's maybe voted in for a year. And maybe there's like a re-election period. But I think we're very much in favor of this optimistic governance approach, uh, you know, working groups, specific subject matter expertise. Um, that's the best way we're going to be able to get like effective governance for the hub moving forward and the wider Adam mechanism. Yeah, I, I would also say the optimistic governance idea that we posted would work with with a committee like Udit was saying, uh, you know, it would work with a committee chosen separately. Um, so it's just that it's like the important part is is, is really the concept that the committee is performing as well um, for the for the atom holders. Um, so, yeah, for consumer chains, I mean, I could see consumer chains nominating a committee when they when they first join, maybe gets replaced, maybe after a year, it gets replaced um, uh, in, a, in a more general election process. But um yeah yeah it maps actually very directly like that is saying that the spend proposal this is this is specifically for spend community spend proposals right and what we're saying is that the way to understand the community spend proposals with the spec is that it, it is actually two things simultaneously it is both a proposal for spending the money and also it is a proposal for by the performers uh putting forward uh, they are nom nominated uh, oversight committee. And so by approving the, 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 the proposal in its entirety, the community is also, uh, you know, giving its blessing around the oversight committee, which is the same. If you could separate this out into two proposals, if you wanted to, and it would be the same, it would work the same way. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's yeah. going to look into it too. I mean, it, it would be more friction, but maybe it's uh not a bad thing. The problem is also we don't still have like multiple choice voting, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. This, this is just like, this is like what you can do today with the, the governance system you have, you know, without adding more complexity. Yeah. I, I see two different gov like, uh, I think we're saying the same thing, but I think for like individual sub, yeah. uh, spending proposals like notional, definitely. I, I can definitely see either way, either it's a separate 
proposal to vote in the oversight committee or it's part of the spend proposal itself. But I definitely think we should have um, consumer chain hub oversight committees that are voted in for not just like ad hoc spend proposals, but for longer term alignment, not just governance, but like economic alignment, especially if the community ends up agreeing that their that protocol and liquidity should be like a business model for the hub to just closer align the consumer chains long term. Yeah. Also, just, you know, there's been I think I, this is what RMIT is working on, right, um, uh, David, it's it's like the um, there's the questions about, you know, what what are the prices that are being charged to consumer chains for the for the for the revenue share? And uh, that's kind of a topic of governance as well. And it's the kind of thing where it's sort of uh, it's been challenging, I think, for that stuff to be decided because you know, it comes out in a prop and it's kind of all or nothing at that point. And then also, you know, teams have tweaked their props, I believe, um, but it's it's kind of like it might be useful to have some people who are thinking about it specifically and can kind of figure out what, what the community is feeling versus what the what the uh, chain team feels. Yeah, I just had my, uh, I mean, we've had multiple calls with them over the past like three weeks or so. They just finally gave like their first presentation to us yesterday about what their research has been um, I guess finding, but one of the things that they're going to be recommending, and it's not like set in stone, we want to get co community feedback over the next two to three weeks, but um, is, you know, it, it should be really time-based consumer chain um, alignment. So it's like, you know, the Neutron agrees to be a, a hub consumer chain for X number of years at this revenue share agreement, but maybe every year or so, it is re-looked at, there are certain KPIs we can measure consumer chain success. And on, on the same time, like we wanna be able to measure the hub success as a good security provider and as a good service provider, if it does other things like sequencing as a service or, or providing liquidity or what have you. But um, yeah, they're, they're kind of looking at like the different revenue structures, uh, like a decision tree branch based on, you know, certain consumer chains should pay should pay the hub in, in specific ways, while others should pay in, in other ways. Maybe should, certain consumer chains should pay strictly an atom back to the hub, while others should be paying in inflation. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we definitely want to look at like the KPI based approach. So it's not, hey, the neutrons forever going to be paying twenty five percent of the hub in, in in perpetuity. It should be kind of uh, a moving target that's always changing based on a bunch of dynamic. Um, I think we might have uh, I think we lost, lost in there. Reception issues. Oh, sorry, do you hear me now? Yeah, no. Okay. I don't know what you heard or didn't, but no worries. I can, John, I actually want to talk to you later about some stuff anyway, so I can kind of relay it to you. We can kind of talk about more. Okay. Um, all right, I think that's probably it, unless someone else has uh, any anything to add. Um, and uh, yeah. Hub's looking good, guys. Thank you, Dave. Yes. Exciting times. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.